Welcome to a new season of Muslims and Mental Health. We are so happy to be back with you and excited about all the new topics we're going to cover this season. We're going to start this month of March with The Psychology of Hate. It's a three-part series um, we'll, which, which will spread over the next three weeks. Uh, following that, we'll have an episode about 10 questions every couple should ask before having sex and move on to what is trauma. So we look forward to you joining us, rejoining us, um, and hopefully you'll invite your friends and family to join us as well. And so let's get started. So today we're gonna to talk about the psychology of hate in a three-part series. And just to get an overview, this particular um, episode, we're gonna talk about what is hate and what is behind it. In part two is, uh, and, and three, we're gonna have an interview with Dr. Joseph Furman and we'll talk about hate and how to understand it as well as how we apply it uh, to what we know and uh, how it manifests in, in the community. So today we're gonna to discuss the historical and current conceptions of hate, classically and, and, and also in the modern times, how we conceptualize it. And to start out with, we'll look at the classical. So for example, Aristotle and Descartes and Spinoza, Hume and Darwin all had competing and actually very diverse views of what hate is. Some of them felt that it was a part of who we are. Some of them saw it as more external, uh, that it wasn't a process that was internal. For example, Descartes thought hate was an awareness of an object as something bad and an urge to withdraw from it. So we go away from, you know, uh, hate uh, as a part of it being a part of us. Whereas Spinoza thought hate was related to pain and uh, indirectly sadness. So it was, cons it was accompanied by a perception of that external cause, right? Aristotle distinguished between it as being thought it could be pain-free. So moving forward to the modern understandings of what hate has been conceptualized as, Alcourt envisioned that hatred was a deep emotion with like aggressive impulses. Uh, Fromm moved on uh, a little bit later to the notion that hate had two parts. One was a rational aspect and the other one was a character um, conditional hate. And so the rational basis was like someone swindled you out of a fortune or something, whereas the character conditioned hate uh, included things more like targeted groups of people. And so this is where we would get like, for example, our modern uh, whole groups of ethnic ethnicities or religious groups like Muslims are hated. Um, came from that character conditional type of hate. But then we had a little bit later Sternberg who had developed the tripartite of love also developed his duplex theory of hate. Within that duplex theory of hate were five concepts. Um, one that hate is very closely related to uh, the psychology of love, so that tripartite idea. Um, another is that hate is neither the opposite of love nor the absence of love. And three would be that hate, like love, has its origins and stories that characterize the target of the emotion. And we'll get into in a minute what some of those characters look like uh, that are uh, the underpinnings of these stories. And then four, that hate, like love, can be characterized in that triangular structure that we just mentioned um, that are generated by the stories, right? And then five, that hate is a major precursor for any terrorist acts. Um, so those are kind of interesting ideas of the five, you know, underlining uh, ideas of his duplex theory of hate. In addition, uh, Sternberg asserted that there were three components of hate, namely that the negation of intimacy, so distancing, uh, that hate in itself by its existence repulses people and pushes people away. Uh, also that there's passion and hate. So you go from uh, that, what, what uh, fuels the hatred is anger and fear, right? So it's like you, have, you get afraid of something, 
you get angry and we know anger to like help us with you know providing boundary but then something transgresses that so then you become you know have hatred um, and then there's decision and commitment and hate that you have to be pretty committed to hate somebody um, and so in that there becomes with that commitment toward the hatred a devaluation and a diminution of another right through contempt so um, those are his three, that's the triangular theory, the structure. Uh, again, that included distancing, uh, like a negation of intimacy, the combination of the fear and anger, which is the passion part, and then the decision commitment part, which is the devaluation and diminution of, um, through contempt of another. Within that, then he further develops a taxonomy of hate, citing that there are many different types of hate. And so just to give you some samplings of what he, um, you know, divided it down into, uh, he described, for example, cool hate, like a cold type of hate, which is like disgust. So somebody, um, and this goes back to that sort of negation of the intimacy, right? Uh, but that it's characterized uh, by disgust toward groups of people or an individual. So one of the things that Sternberg created in his duplex theory of hate that I mentioned before is that that this applies towards both individuals and groups. And this was this departed from where Fromm was, which when he talked about the rational hate and the um, character conditional hate, he saw one as more individual and one more group, right? Uh, with Sternberg, he sees uh, the duplex theory applying to both those uh, who are individuals and of groups. So the second type of hate that Sternberg describes is the hot hate or the passionate hate, right? And this is when um, a person feels a fear toward like a threat, for example, or maybe perhaps uh, their fight or flight, that limbic system kicks in, they have that fight or flight, or if they've been previously traumatized, we see people freeze in this type of, of situation. So it could be fight, flight, or freeze. Uh, and then the third type is a cold hate, which is that third part of that triangle, the devaluation part, where there's a sense and thoughts, thoughts of unworthiness and treatment uh, to, in that direction toward a person or a targeted group. The fourth type that he recognizes is called a boiling hate. And this is a revulsion or disgust. It's a, it's a combination of um, the, the negation of intimacy plus the anger and fear and the uh, passionate part. And this is where somebody could take level the hate to the level of dehumanizing another. Um, so we're seeing an escalation in here and sort of the, the value of the hatred. We go from disgust to now a devaluation. Um, so we see that level of hate becoming stronger. Then number five, he has a simmering hate, which is a loathing. It's, he, he calls this a disgust of the negation of intimacy plus the devaluation of the decision of commitment. And then six, we have a seething hate. It sounds just like it is, where it's seething. Uh, it's passionate plus a commitment to it. And it's characterized by like reviling uh, a targeted individual or group. And then lastly, uh, in his taxonomy, we have the seventh type, which he calls a burning hate. And this burning hate is characterized by annihilating another. Um, so we can kind of see with his taxonomy, there's like, you know, an increasing, from one to seven, there's an increasing um, sort of burning to this hate, uh, that it becomes more and more aggressive and more um, powerful as you get down to the, the, the last one, the, see, the, the burning hate rather, uh, which is very powerful because it's seeking to annihilate another person um, and has action. So Sternberg goes on to create danger levels of hate um, and this perhaps may have influenced our current you know, TSA level threats, right? Because it looks at uh, danger levels from a zero to three level um, of course, we have more than that in our airports, but uh, the idea was that with certain conditions, we have a higher level of hatred. 
So one of the ideas that Sternberg emphasized in terms of hate was the idea that it has, comes from stories that are created, uh, particularly propaganda. And there are three parts to this going along with his tripartite theory, right? So the first part emphasizes that, that negation of intimacy through the propaganda and the story. And then the second part relates to the function of a generation of passion. So if we can negate the, like, so in other words, let's take our community, for example, we've seen a lot of propaganda over the last few years about the Muslim community. And it started with the idea that we're an other. We're not American, we're not um, something that you can relate to, we're so conservative or we're so extreme, uh, we have weird practices, there were so many different um, ways of devaluing or removing the ability to be have intimacy to see the other. Um, this was the first step, right? So, or also like that women are oppressed in Islam or that we're uneducated if we wear a hijab, right? These are the kind of messaging, propaganda that was given to take away that intimacy. The second step was the function of the generation of passion. So generating this idea that after we've established that we're an other, now we need society to be passionate about that, like we can't associate with that other, we can't be around the other, that other will hurt us, we need to get rid of the other, right? So that second level of passion was inserted. And we saw that actually manifest in things like the movies. So if you go back to even the 1990s, uh, as early as I can remember, there were movies that made people from the Middle East the villains. And we still see this, unfortunately, it continues until today. We've seen um, people from the Middle East, people from South Asia, uh, and East Asia, predominantly Muslim um, populated countries, uh, being made into the villain. Until recently, we saw a shift in that with the North Koreans because now they've become somewhat of a new enemy. Um, however, before that, and, and continuing, actually, we have seen Muslims consistently for the last 20, 30 years be filmed as the enemy. And this gets into the hearts and minds of people watching it, consuming it. So that then generates that second level of Sternberg's theory. Then lastly is the um, idea that you can generate a commitment to those false beliefs, right? So now it is assumed that when people encounter a Muslim in society in America, they must be our enemy. They're not going to be our friend, they're going to be our foe. And now that you have generated these ideas and you now are moving to commitment it makes it easy for people to support things like, let's go kill 600,000 people in Iraq. You know, that let's go, you know, hurt um, individuals who are not like us because they're not one of us. We can avoid entering into things in, like in Syria, for example. Why? Because we don't know those people. They're not one of us. Forgetting the fact that there are not only Muslims in Syria, but Christians as well, and Jewish people, and all kinds of people who are in Syria, as well as Iraq, as well as the Middle East in general. So, uh, as you know, and, and interestingly enough, that's another falsehood that was perpetrated, right? In the sense that all Muslims are from the Middle East. In fact, they're not. Uh, that's one of the, you know, smaller populations. We have other countries and areas of the world where there are larger populations uh, of Muslims within that society. So there have been many um, uh, stories, if you will, and, and that go along with Sternberg's, you know, tripartite theory here of hate that look pretty, uh, like, like he has a pretty good theory going here, when it comes to our, our uh, Muslim community, particularly. To get to a little bit of the underpinning of the stories that Sternberg talks about, um, he created several characters, and this is not by any means a comprehensive list of all the characters that he thought were a part of stories that then generate hate and lead to hate, but 
do here I just want to give you some of them to give you an idea of what you might be looking for when you're trying to deconstruct you know when you see something that looks like propaganda this will help you deconstruct the plot of the propaganda by knowing the characters involved right so some of them are the stranger right the other uh, being able to convince you that you can't uh, interact with this person that they're so they're different and in a strange way so you can't really find a way to relate to them the impure person or the contaminated person um, we saw this uh, back in the, in the 90s with people who got diagnosed with HIV and AIDS, right? Got to stay away from them because at the time they were using the propaganda that you could get it off the toilet seats, right? So there was a real danger, a real threat, and therefore, you know, uh, people started hating them to the point where they couldn't even get health care in hospitals. Um, they also demonized it and said that it was a gay problem. When in point of fact, it was affecting society at large. Um, and now we see in 2017 that some of the largest groups affected by this epidemic are teenagers in their late teens and senior citizens. So it has nothing to do with whether you're LGBT. Uh, it has to do with, you know, how well you take care of your practices of, of, of sex, right? Um, the controller, the person who's trying to control others and control the world is another character. The faceless foe, so the person that you can't really see. Um, an enemy of God. So if I can convince you that the Muslim's idea of God is not our God, it's some other God, and convince you that, that we don't have anything in common, that we're not worshiping the same God, then I've got you uh, as an enemy of God. Somebody who's morally bankrupt, a, purveyor, a purveyor of death, right? Somebody, people have a lot of difficulty dealing with their existential issues. So to give you a sense that this person could cause you death or harm, you want to stay away from them. And you might even develop hatred toward them because you don't want to deal with that. Um, the barbarian, somebody who's greedy, the criminal, um, the torturer, the seducer, Right, it's another one that uh, sort of gets in under under the um, wire typically because people don't think of that one. But the seducer is 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 somebody who, despite being uh, loathsome, can seduce women, for example. Right, um, and, and and more like in 2017, and the young people we hear them calling them player player. Right, these are people that, um, despite their bad behavior can continue to attract uh, people into their their ways, their ways of behavior. Somebody who's mean to animals or a power monger, uh, the subtle infiltrator, the comic character, all of these are examples of the kind of characters that Sternberg asserts are underpinnings of the stories that create hate. The main idea is that if we can deconstruct the stories or the propaganda we can start to get to the core of why something is hated. And then once we are, we are aware of the hatred, then we can start addressing it directly. And how do we address that directly? By starting to deconstruct stereotypes, implicit bias, looking at why somebody sees another as an other, by getting together with people and getting to know one another, being seen by each other. Um, these are the, the ways and methods that, that we can impart to start addressing hatred. In our next episode, we are going to be looking uh, more directly uh, at, these, at these issues with Dr. Joseph Futterman. Um, today, I just wanted to give you an overview of what is in the literature of the psychology of hate, both classically and in more modern times. So again, remember, we're looking all the way back to Aristotle and all the way forward to Sternberg being the most widely understood and known uh, modern theorist around the psychology of hate. So as we conclude, I ask you and invite you to keep an open mind about how you conceptualize hate. 
Some people see hatred as the most understudied emotion that exists, but other people see it as more of a complex concept and don't even relate it to emotion. So keep an open mind. We're going to have two more parts to this series where we will be talking with Dr. Joseph Futterman, who may be able to help guide you in your own understanding and development of understanding of what hatred is. Thank you for joining us for this first part of the three-part series of the psychology of hate. We're so glad that uh, to start off our new season and we look forward to seeing you again. If you have any comments, questions, or concern, please contact us at nafshealertherapy at gmail.com. That's N-A-F-S-H-E-A-L-E-R-T-H-E-R-A-P-Y at gmail.com. And you will also find additional resources on our adjunctive website at www.nafshealertherapy.wordpress.com. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum.